today, let's start with a basic question that drives strategic management thoughts and investigation. And that question is, what leads to differential firm performance? Why does one firm outperform its competitors? What makes your company more successful than mine? These are the kinds of questions that keep CEOs up at night and give scholars ongoing opportunities for research. Although there are a number of schools of thought regarding differential firm performance, there are two that I think are most relevant for supply chain thought. First, there's the positioning view, and second, there's the resource-based view. In this lesson, we're gonna focus on the positioning view advocated by Michael Porter. Professor Porter is a famous strategic management scholar at Harvard University and one of the leading proponents of strategic positioning. Porter offers a number of influential insights and complex strategic management thoughts, but at its core, the essence of Porter comes down to three things. I call them the pillars of Porter because they are the foundation of the positioning school and explain why one company succeeds more than another. Let's quickly identify each of these pillars and then we'll do a deeper dive into each one. The first pillar is position in the external environment. According to Porter, firms will be more successful when they leverage their strengths to obtain an advantageous position within the external environment. Or said another way, a firm's performance is differentiated by their industry structure and their place within that industry structure. We'll talk more about this here in a bit. The second pillar is firm strengths. Porter tells us that firms have two basic types of potential firm strengths. First, firms can perform the exact same activities as their competitors, but they will have strength if they perform these activities in a way that is much more efficient. And we call this efficiency. The second type of firm strength comes when a firm performs a completely different set of activities that deliver a unique mix of value. And we call this differentiation. The third and final pillar of Porter has to do with generic strategy. Porter suggests that applying firm strengths can yield three different generic strategies. And they are cost leadership, differentiation, and focus. These three generic strategies take advantage of specific types of firm strength relative to the strengths of its competitors. So now let's look at all three of these pillars of Porter in a little bit more detail. The first pillar was position in the external environment. And that's how a firm can obtain advantageous positioning within their industry structure. To clearly describe this, Professor Porter gives us his five forces model. These forces describe power or threats of external industry structures. For example, the power of customers and suppliers or the threat of things like market entry, substitutes, or intensity of rivalry. From a firm's perspective, the ideal industry structure would have low levels of customer power, supplier power, threats of market entry, threats of substitutes, and intensity of rivalry. Why would this be the ideal industry structure? Because it would generate the most profit for a firm. Think about it. If customers have limited power, then the firm can charge higher prices with little to no investment in improved products or services. Likewise, if suppliers have limited power, then a firm can force those suppliers to reduce costs and improve service. The same holds true for threats. Without the threat of new competitors or substitute products, a firm can rest on its laurels, avoid costly improvement efforts, and maintain elevated prices. The same goes for low levels of rivalry. If a firm doesn't have too many close competitors, then it can continue to reap benefits without too many costs. So in a best case scenario, a firm might hope to have three or four of these factors, but they're constantly evolving. You can imagine if an industry structure was that ideal, soon competitors would be trying to break into that market. When an external industry structure is less than ideal, Porter suggests that a firm's strategic efforts should be focused on reducing the forces of customer and supplier power. Porter also talks about reducing the threats of new rivals, competitors, or substitute products. The beauty of the five forces model is that it provides firms with an understanding of how industry structure affects performance and where managers need to focus their strategic efforts. Let's move on and talk some more now about the second pillar of Porter, and that's firm strengths. 
Earlier I explained that Porter outlined two potential sources of firm strength, and they were efficiency and differentiation. According to Porter, the first potential source of firm strength comes from being efficient. If firms do the same thing as their competitors, but do it for less, then they have a cost advantage. And being a low cost provider is a strength that can be strategically leveraged. Porter's second potential source of firm strength comes from differentiation. Differentiation refers to doing something that no other competitor can do. If firms can provide highly differentiated products or services that are in demand, then customers will often be willing to pay a price premium. These two types of potential firm strengths in Pillar 2 can be used strategically, which brings us to our third pillar of Porter, and that's generic strategies for applying those strengths. Depending on which type of strengths a firm possesses from Pillar 2, and whether they apply those strengths in a broad or narrow scope, Porter theorizes three potential generic strategies for Pillar 3. First, the cost leadership generic strategy takes advantage of a firm's ability to be efficient and drive down costs. When a firm has a lower cost structure than its competitors, then it can generate super normal profits by either lowering consumer prices and generating higher sales volume, or maintaining average prices and sales volume while pulling in higher margins. Walmart is a prime example of a well-formulated and well-implemented cost leadership strategy. Can you think of any other firms that have mastered this approach? A second generic strategy is differentiation. A differentiation strategy is a firm's ability to offer creative and innovative products or services. Firms that successfully utilize this strategy are masters at understanding customer needs, new product development, and sometimes even new market development. Differentiation strategies lead to new products with a whole bunch of marketing buzz and publicity. Consumers are often willing to pay price premiums for these cool or trendy new products, leading to increased profits. Apple's a good example of a company that thrives on a differentiation strategy. What other companies do the same thing? The third generic strategy is focus strategy. A focus strategy is when a firm concentrates all its efforts on a very specific subset of a market or a niche segment. Firms that use this strategy have in-depth understanding of very unique customer needs and then develop products or services that appeal to that very specific market segment. A focus strategy can partially take advantage of cost leadership or differentiation strengths, but at its very core, a focus strategy comes down to emphasis on meeting very specific needs of very specific customers. For example, most college towns have a company that focuses on the quite unique needs of their students, alumni, and fans. So now that we've reviewed the three basic pillars of Porter, I think it's a fair question to ask, what the heck do these pillars have to do with supply chain management? Or said more eloquently, why is a supply chain manager should I pay attention to the Positioning School of Strategic Management? I think if Porter teaches us nothing else, he drives home the idea that you must understand the external environment that you operate within and you must understand how it affects your business. Let's take a look back at our three pillars and see how they directly will impact you as a supply chain manager. Under the first pillar, Porter's Five Forces model specifically gives supply chain managers a starting point for understanding big structural influences on profitability and competitiveness. But I would contend it is just a starting point. There are other external factors at play that also affect ongoing logistics operations. For example, many modern supply chains are truly global and extend to all regions of the world. With that type of broad footprint, Supply chain managers must be aware of all the risks and opportunities that are constantly evolving. Any changes in the external environment along that complex supply chain can affect a firm's ability to get the right products to the right place at the right time. Now, earlier I explained that Porter outlined two potential sources of firm strength, and those were efficiency and differentiation. If you're a supply chain manager, you'll want to pay attention to Porter's explanation of where those firm strengths come from. 
And the answer is your firm's value chain. Porter describes a value chain as a set of interrelated activities a company uses to create a competitive advantage. The five steps in a value chain give a company the ability to create value that exceeds the cost of producing its products or services for customers. The five steps are inbound logistics, operations, outbound logistics, marketing and sales, and service. Maximizing the activities in any one of these five steps allows a company to have an advantage over its competitors and ultimately generate a higher profit. At first glance, this just sounds like a rudimentary supply chain that is limited to an internal firm focus. However, if we take it and expand it to include a modern global supply chain management approach, an approach where individual firms no longer compete on their own, we find that this same logic does hold true. In a modern supply chain, for a firm to obtain strengths of efficiency or differentiation, that firm must efficiently and effectively manage processes across functional, organizational, and international boundaries. They must select supply chain partners with complementary skill sets that create valuable synergies. They must communicate, collaborate, and coordinate with supply chain partners to create value that meets or exceeds customer expectations. In today's global economy, firms no longer compete against firms. Rather, supply chains compete against supply chains. As Porter correctly identified in the second pillar, much of a firm's strength does indeed come from a firm's ability to manage its value chain. And finally, let's look at what supply chain managers can use from the third pillar of Porter. Supply chain managers also need to thoroughly understand their firm's generic strategy. They need to know whether their firm is pursuing a cost leadership, differentiation, or focus strategy in order to ensure that their supply chain actions are consistent with the overall corporate approach. Supply chain strategy needs to fit with firm strategy and vice versa. They need to be aligned. Without appropriate strategic fit, firms will lack the consistency of purpose, action, and resource allocation to be successful. So let's summarize our lesson. Today we talked about the three pillars of Porter. First, the importance of positioning within an industry structure in the external environment. Second, the potential sources of firm strength. And third, the generic strategies derived from efficiency and differentiation strengths. After reviewing these aspects of business strategy, we then explained how and why they are important to supply chain managers. I hope you can see the value of the Positioning School of Strategic Thought and its vital link to supply chain management.